Hello world, this is Random Fix. In this video today, I'm going to be covering with you guys the Infinity Drive Cycle Procedure. You are going to need an OBD2 scanner just like the one I'm holding here. And the nice thing is this connects right underneath your driver's side footwell area. And the connector is super nice because it only goes in one way. And once you slide the connector on, what happens is you get power on the unit. And once you have power, you want to make sure that the check engine light is on but the engine should be off that way you can go ahead and check the status of the inspection monitors and I'm gonna have a link to everything in the video down below and let's go ahead and get this video started now Since the Infinity Drive Cycle is a little bit more time consuming, please don't hesitate to check out the playlist here titled Tips to Pass an Emissions Test. And on this playlist, you'll find the actual drive cycle in action here, where I actually walk you through this, as well as if you need to understand exactly what the drive cycles are, check out the short video titled What to Do to Smog a Car, and you'll find video links in the description box below as well. Hello world, this is Random Fix. In this video today, we're going to be discussing my 10-step Infinity drive cycle. So you have a 1996 and newer Infinity. You definitely want to stay tuned till the end. And before we start with the drive cycle, make sure when you're doing this test that you do this at off-peak hours. And hopefully you can find yourself an open country road that you can conduct this test on because it is kind of involved and it is going to take you a few times to get this ready. OBD2 is basically it's onboard diagnostics type 2. And this started in 1996. So you'll find this little connector underneath your dash in your Infinity vehicle. And this is really nice actually because before 1996, every vehicle manufacturer had their own port. And OBD2 has made everything very simple when it comes down to diagnostics. And DTC stands for Diagnostic Trouble Code. And there's two kinds of diagnostic trouble codes. For the engine here, we got a pending and a hard set code. A hard set code is one where the computer knows the issue exists and it's triggered your check engine light. And a pending code is one where it knows that there's something going on, but it needs more information before it actually triggers the check engine light. If you have a hard set code that's triggering on within milliseconds of the engine starting, you may have damaged wiring, broken sensors, something is not right. So no matter how many times you do this drive cycle, if you have a pending or a hard set code, you're going to have to take care of that issue before you actually start the drive cycle. MIL stands for malfunction indicator light. This is also known as a check engine light, the service engine light, service engine zoom light. When you're using an OBD2 scanner, you might see the OK. This lets you know that that monitor is complete. It's set and it's ready. When you see I and C, this means that it's incomplete, unset, and not ready. NA means it does not apply, so skip that monitor and focus on the unset monitors. Right here, I have five monitors, and this is the order that the monitors normally set in. So we have an oxygen sensor heater. And what the oxygen sensor heater does, it helps get the oxygen sensor ready faster so the vehicle can do a better job of taking care of this emission control systems. Then you have the oxygen sensor itself. And on most vehicles, there's at least two oxygen sensors. So there's one before the catalyst, and that one is known as the pre-cat or upstream oxygen sensor. And right after the catalyst, there's another one, and that's called a post-cat or a downstream oxygen sensor. There's the EGR monitor. This stands for the exhaust gas recirculation. We have a CAT monitor. Some people will say their CATs have gone bad. And basically what they're saying is their catalyst or the catalytic converter has gone bad. And so a catalytic converter is the part. We have an EVAP system here. And EVAP stands for Evaporative Emissions Control System. And basically this keeps the gas fumes out of the atmosphere. And to help you with your Infinity Drive Cycle test, 
you really want to try to use a stopwatch during the test. Some technical parameters with the infinities that we need to understand. Most of the time, your inspection monitors will get ready on their own under normal driving rear conditions. However, as the vehicle ages, you're going to have to get this drive cycle down to a T and make sure you do this exactly as I'm going to cover this with you guys. And before you start the test, you want to make sure that the gas level is between 25 to 75 percent full. 75 is highly recommended and park on a level surface. Make sure the vehicle is completely cold and that the engine coolant temperature is below 86 degrees. Make sure you don't have any diagnostic trouble codes, whether it's pending or hard set. Make sure your battery is good and your alternator is in good condition. Keep the keys out of the ignition the night before and away from the car. Make sure your doors are locked so that way the vehicle knows that it can go ahead and test everything in the morning once you start it. So this is the actual drive cycle with your Infinity vehicle. You want to go ahead and start the drive cycle by starting the engine. Allow the engine to idle until the coolant temperature basically gets to operating temperature. And the most important thing here is it's better to overdo this by one or two minutes than to start the drive cycle when the vehicle hasn't reached operating temperature. Step two, you want to go ahead and accelerate the vehicle to 55 miles an hour and then quickly release the gas pedal for 10 seconds so that way the vehicle can coast. And when you're accelerating, you want to do this in a very brisk manner. So you don't want to take two minutes to get up to 55 miles an hour. So find yourself that open country road when you're doing this. You're going to jump to step three, which is basically you're going to go and speed back up to 53 to 60 miles an hour. And you want to go ahead and maintain that speed for at least nine minutes. Step four, you want to come to a complete stop. And one thing that I like to do is when I'm jumping from step three to step four, I like to let the vehicle coast all the way down to a complete stop. So no changing gears, no hitting the brakes. And this will do a really good job of setting some of those monitors like the EGR. Step five, you want to accelerate the vehicle to 35 miles an hour and maintain that speed for at least 20 seconds. And step six is basically you're going to go and repeat step four and five for a total of 10 times. So you're going to go stop again and accelerate to 35 miles an hour. And you're going to go and do this again for a total of 10 times. Step seven, you're going to accelerate the vehicle to 55 miles an hour again and maintain that speed now for at least three minutes. The key word here is at least. And when you're doing this, you want to make sure you maintain speed. Your air conditioning should be off. Your cruise control should be off. And when you started the test, if your headlights were off, you want to make sure that they stay off and you don't want to change anything. So if your radio is off, keep the radio off too. And you may have to do this a couple of times to get this correct, but do not turn off the vehicle. This is very important. Step eight, you want to go ahead and stop the vehicle, place the vehicle in park or neutral if you have a manual transmission, and let the vehicle go ahead and idle for about a minute and turn the vehicle off. And when you get back from your test drive, you want to scan it. And if everything is done, it'll say zero codes incomplete, seven that are complete, and four that don't apply, and zero codes found. And this is a 100% chance that you're going to go ahead and pass your emissions tests as long as you haven't altered anything on your vehicle and your vehicle passes the visual inspection as well. Step 10, repeat steps 1 through 8 at least one more time and you may get away with it on your very first try. And once your monitors are set, you're ready to now go and get the vehicle smogged. Remember, if your vehicle is a 96 through 99 vehicle, you will have to get the vehicle tested on a dyno at 15 and 25 miles an hour. They're going to use a gas analyzer to test the vehicle's emissions. They're going to test your gas cap. They'll do some other tests. And they're also going to do a visual. Even if you have a 2000 and newer vehicle, they're going to do a visual. 
but on a 2000 and newer vehicle, they're just going to check for the OBD2 readiness. So they're going to plug in their OBD2 reader into the vehicle from the state and check the monitors. Remember the visual inspection consists of checking for altered parts like cold air intakes, throttle spacers, cracked vacuum hoses, missing catalytic converters. They're going to do a visual smoke test to make sure that you don't have clouds of smoke coming out the tailpipe. And as of the end of 2020, this is the current rules here for California. And California happens to be one of the stricter states. So you have to check the regulations for your own state. Here in California, if you have a 96 through 99 vehicle, you can have any one monitor show incomplete and still pass. Now, depending on the smog station, they may just go ahead and plug in their OBD2 reader. It's not connected to the state. See that you have a monitor that's incomplete and tell you to keep driving because they don't want anything to come back to them to show that on their record for the shop showing that they passed X amount of vehicles with unset monitors. So if that happens to you, go to another station. And if you have a 2000 and newer vehicle, only the EVAP could be unset. And with diesel powered vehicles, 98 through 2006, basically all the monitors have to show complete. On newer diesel vehicles, 2007 and newer, you can have any two monitors show incomplete. And remember when you're selling a car, it's the seller's responsibility to make sure that they supply the buyer with a smog certificate. And normally there's no way of waiving this requirement unless you're selling to a dealer or dismantler. So even if you write as is on the title, that doesn't really mean anything because if it goes to court, you're most likely gonna lose that suit unless they're a dealer or a dismantler. And if you're a buyer, never buy a vehicle unless all the inspection monitors are ready. And 99% of the times, if the inspection monitors are not ready, is because somebody has erased that check engine light on purpose to cover up an existing issue, whether it's a dealer or a private seller. And 1% of the time is caused by a weak or faulty battery and if this is the case you still have to find out why that battery is dying because you could have a potential short you could have an alternator and when there's a bad battery in a vehicle all kinds of funny things start happening from smog emissions monitors not getting ready to transmissions acting up and it's a big list of potential issues I'm going to show you guys the configuration on a typical four-cylinder vehicle here. And on a typical four-cylinder vehicle, you have two oxygen sensors and one catalytic converter. So here's the vehicle here. This is the engine. And as the exhaust makes it out, the engine block through the headers, downpipe, and it will go past this upstream oxygen sensor, which is known as the pre-cat oxygen sensor. And then the exhaust will go through the catalytic converter here. Then the downstream or post-cat oxygen sensor will go ahead and get a reading. And the way the computer is able to verify the efficiency of the catalytic converter here is by taking this reading and this reading and comparing them based on the parameters of what the vehicle manufacturer has set up to verify that this, in fact, is working correctly. And after the emissions pass the downstream oxygen sensor, it goes through a little resonator here, down through the tailpipe, through the muffler, and out to the atmosphere. And here on a six cylinder or a cylinder, I'm gonna show you guys a couple of diagrams down here. On these, you can have three or four oxygen sensors, depending on the setup, and one or two catalytic converters. So, if we look at this diagram right here, this is a V6 motor, so it has a total of six cylinders, three on one side, three on the other side, thus making it a V6 motor. And whatever side cylinder number one is located on, that's called bank one. 
So if you're dealing with an emissions issue and it tells you that sensor one on bank two is bad or acting up, you can look at the opposite side of cylinder one and know that it's the opposite side. This sensor right here that may potentially need to get replaced. So we have one, two, three oxygen sensors on this vehicle and one catalytic converter. And this too is a V6 motor. The only difference is the cylinder number one is located on the lower side here. And this is bank one. And now this is bank two. And here on this setup here, this is a V6 motor. And we have a total of six cylinders again, three on one side, three on the other side. But now we have one, two, three, four oxygen sensors and one, two catalytic converters. And if it was a V8, it would just have an extra cylinder on each side. And here's my top eight tips to pass an emissions test. The very first one is gonna be make sure that you smog right the very first time. So if you know your vehicle has an issue, you want to make sure to get that issue fixed before you try to go and smog the vehicle. And you should never really fail an emissions test because with these simple scan tools, you can verify that all the monitors are ready. And before you go to the station, you can just do a simple plug-in and it'll let you know that the car's inspection monitors are ready. And you can do this with confidence, knowing that you're going to go and pass now because any failed Emissions data will get reported to Carfax and AutoCheck, and this can actually reduce the value of your vehicle. Number two, you want to make sure that the check engine line is off but working. So before you purchase a vehicle, put the key in the ignition and turn it to the very last position and verify that the check engine light is there. And I've seen people actually remove the check engine light. Three. This really helps with those 96 through 99 vehicles. You want to make sure that the tires are properly inflated as this will lessen the load and will allow the vehicle better operations. The same thing with the oil here. The oil actually contains a lot of the hydrocarbons and since they're going to be doing a real emissions test using a gas analyzer, you want to make sure you reduce the hydrocarbon numbers here and this is a simple oil change. And Tip five, you want to go ahead and take the vehicle for a very long test drive before you reach the emission station and leave the car on if possible before you get it tested, with the emissions probe. Tip number six, use some fuel additives. I personally love the Lucas Oil upper cylinder loop. You'll find a link to this in the video box below as well as anything else that I showed you guys in the video. Tip number seven, you want to avoid wet weather and this is not to say that you cannot pass an emissions test with it raining outside however you'll just get much better results if the tires are dry and tip number eight do not disconnect the battery unless you have a battery saver device set up and these are about 15 bucks and basically this will keep your cards computer data your clocks your radio stations all in sync and remember, the only real solution oftentimes is to repair or replace the component. So there's no such thing as a miracle in a bottle. But if you're looking for a quick fix for your catalytic converter, just because maybe you don't have the time or money to go and have that issue fixed, I have a couple of videos down in the video box below that cover such products and I'll give you guys my honest and truthful review of them and some preventative tips here. I love doing everything myself so if you can try doing some of the simpler repairs yourself like the engine oil changes, transmission fluids, differentials, changing the filters, the engine air filter, the cabin air filter, the fuel filter, if you clean your throttle body, change the wipers, and do the brakes on your own vehicle. This is such a nice thing to start doing because the more you learn about a vehicle, the better off you're going to be as far as taking care of it. And what I have found out from my own experience of working on cars over the last 27 years is 
the time that I actually save doesn't even compare to the amount of money because a lot of people go and get their oil changed at the dealer and that could take one hour or two hours. Most of the times I'm able to change the oil on my vehicle in under 15 minutes. So not only did I save between 60 to 80 bucks, but I saved myself at least 45 minutes of not having to wait around and I got it done and I can go move on with my life. So I would love to hear back from you guys. If you guys found the video to be helpful, please comment down below. And if you're a Nissan owner, you want to make sure that you watch the Nissan video. I'll have a link to that video in the description box below. If you guys are new to the channel, consider hitting that subscribe button right here and smashing on the notification button as well. So anytime I post videos, you guys will get notified. And thank you again for watching.